Hello, I am Alon Burstein. I'm a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Political Science and Israel Institute fellow at the University of California, Irvine. While every day I upload summaries of what has happened in the Israel-Hamas war in the past 24 hours, today, uh, January 14th, marks 100 days since the war began, and thus today I'm uploading more of a general summary of what has happened in the last 100 days in the different arenas and where do things stand. So starting where things began in the war, on the morning of October 7th, 2023, between 2,000 and 3,000, Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad fighters burst through between 15 and 80 breaks that they had created in the barrier between Israel and the Gaza Strip. They overran military outposts and bases of the IDF and continued into Israeli towns and kibbutzim. The attack lasted several days. By the end of it, it was a complete massacre. Right now, the numbers stand at 1,194 Israelis that were killed in this attack. There were also substantial acts of sexual violence throughout the attack, and 257 hostages, including both Israelis and foreign nationals, were kidnapped back to the Gaza Strip. These included entire families, babies, children, and elderly. Since then, 110 hostages were released in a hostage exchange and a truce that was decided upon between Israel and Hamas mediated by Qatar between November 24th and November 30th. Of those released, 86 of them were Israelis, 24 were foreign nationals. In addition to them, the bodies of 10 hostages were recovered in the IDF operation in the Gaza Strip. Three of these were hostages that were killed by the IDF mistakenly after they managed to escape. Of the other seven bodies that were recovered, there's no report about the circumstances in which they died. The IDF managed to rescue one live hostage from the Gaza Strip, bringing us to where we are now, where still in captivity there are 136 people who were kidnapped on October 7th. This includes both Israelis and foreign nationals. Of these 136, 25 roughly are confirmed dead by the IDF. Most of these were killed on October 7th and their bodies were kidnapped back to the Gaza Strip. No reports were made about the circumstances in which the others died. Moving on to what is happening in the Gaza Strip itself, the Israeli retaliation against the Gaza Strip began on October 8th with an unprecedented bombing campaign and a complete siege that was imposed on the Gaza Strip. While there was a siege that was imposed to varying, de varying degrees in the last years, this was a complete siege. I'll say more about this later. During the first three weeks of the war of Israel's retaliation, the IDF carried out a massive unprecedented bombing campaign throughout the Gaza Strip. And on October 13th, the IDF began uh, issuing evacuation orders through different UN channels to Palestinian civilians in the northern parts of the Gaza Strip that they are to begin evacuating the northern parts of the Gaza Strip because the IDF plans to invade there. The invasion of the IDF began into the Gaza Strip on October the night between October 26th and October 27th, and the IDF announced towards the end of December that it had achieved complete operational control over the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. On December 3rd, the IDF began its ground invasion to the southern parts of the Gaza Strip, specifically focusing on the town of Han Yunis. And at the end of December, the IDF also began its invasion of the central parts of the Gaza Strip, primarily the refugee camps Al Burej and Al Nusirat and Al Maghazi. However, it is also starting its activities in Deir el And in the last several days, there have been different reports that the IDF is planning its ground operation in the town of Rafah as well. Regarding a summary of the 100 days, over 9,000 rockets, mortars, and missiles have been sent from the Gaza Strip targeting the different areas of Israel. These targeted the southern parts of Israel, the central parts of Israel, going all the way to the north of Israel and Jerusalem. 3,000 to 4,000 of these were fired during the October 7th attack itself. These have, of course, caused a lot of injuries and a lot of damage. The IDF bombing campaign in return, the IDF stated that it has carried out over 30,000 targeted attacks in the Gaza Strip. Regarding the bombing campaign, on December 24th, the Washington Post put out an analysis stating that between October 7th and November 27th, the IDF dropped over 29,000 bombs from the air on the Gaza Strip, some of these weighing over 900 kilos. It also reported that estimates st state that 37,379 buildings were damaged in the Gaza Strip, of which just over 10,000 were completely destroyed. Since then, as of January 4th, some estimates state that since the war began, Israel has dropped over 45,000 missiles and bombs in the Gaza Strip, amounting to over 65,000 tons of bombs that were dropped on the enclave. In addition to this, the IDF is reporting the vast array of tunnel networks that it has uncovered in the Gaza Strip that Hamas has built over the years. According to the IDF, these span upwards of 500 and 600 kilometers of tunnels, and some of these are 20 to 30 meters buried underground. The IDF published an initial estimate of the, tu of the tunnels that have been uncovered so far, stating that they were built with upwards of 6,000 tons of concrete and upwards of 1,800 tons of metals, and that they cost over tens of millions of dollars and were built for at least 10, uh, and it took at least 10 years to build them regarding casualties in the Gaza Strip. 
The Palestinian Health Ministry in the Gaza Strip is reporting 23,843 Palestinians that have been killed since the war began, 60,317 are reported injured, and that there are upwards of 10,000 Palestinians who are buried under the rubbles of the different buildings, most of these presumed dead. The Palestinian Health Ministry is reporting that of those who are confirmed dead, 70% are women and children under the age of 18. The IDF is reporting that 188 IDF soldiers were killed in the Gaza Strip since the invasion began. Upwards of 1,200 have been injured. In the IDF report regarding casualties in the Gaza Strip, the IDF did not publish its own estimate of how many Gazans have been killed. However, it did state that over 9,000 Hamas operatives have been killed in the Gaza Strip since the war began, out of an estimate 30,000 Hamas operatives. In addition to this, two division commanders of Hamas and 19 brigade commanders have been assassinated, and over 50 platoon commanders have been assassinated as well. Upwards of 2,300 Palestinians in the Gaza Strip have been arrested since the war began. Many of these were sent back to Israel for interrogation. In some cases, after it was confirmed that they have no affiliation with Hamas or the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, they were released back to the Gaza Strip. Moving on to the humanitarian situation in the Gaza Strip. Absolute siege was imposed in the Gaza Strip as of October 8th. These included stopping all aid trucks from coming in, shutting down the water lines that Israel had connected to the Gaza Strip, and the electricity lines were shut off to the Gaza Strip as of October 11th. Some of the water lines were restored to the southern parts of the Gaza Strip later on. I will add that Israel only provides about 20% of the water to the Gaza Strip, so we're only referring to that 20%. Eight trucks were at first not permitted to come in at all to the Gaza Strip. However, on October 21st, a deal was brokered, and Israel started to permit. At first, it was just 28 trucks coming in a day, and since then, the number have increased. The truce that, uh, that occurred at the end of November increased the number of eight trucks exponentially. This was part of the deal. It was supposed to be increased to up to 200 trucks per day. That has not been consistent. Uh, an average of between 100 and 200 trucks come in per day, carrying food, water, and medical supplies. I will add, just for some proportion, Prior to the war, in the Gaza Strip, upwards of 500 aid trucks carrying food, water, and medical supplies, fuel, and cooking gas would come in every day. So that was before the war, and before the current situation, 500 trucks were coming in each day. Now, between 100 and 200 aid trucks are coming in each day. Regarding a summary of the last 100 days, the IDF reported that in the first 100 days of the war, 7,653 trucks were inspected by the IDF and transferred to the different entry points, Kerem, Shalom, Nitzana, and Rafah. Of these, most of them did enter the Gaza Strip. According to the breakdown of the IDF, these included 3,950 trucks of food, 1,151 trucks carrying different shelter equipment, 1,007 trucks carrying medical supplies, 863 trucks carrying water, and 682 trucks carrying mixed goods. Regarding the situation in the Gaza Strip, upwards of 1.9 million Palestinians, this is above 85% of the Gazan population, are currently internally displaced. It's important to understand that the Gaza Strip is not a big place. It is an area of roughly 151 square miles, or 363 square kilometers. Within it, there are between 2.2 and 2.4 million Palestinians. 1.9 million Palestinians are currently internally displaced and are all in the, in the southern parts of the Gaza Strip, primarily in the areas of Rafah and the Muasi. These are two areas that the IDF has designated as safe zones for now. However, evacuation orders were issued to some areas of the northern parts of the Muasi several days ago, so the IDF may be planning an operation there. However, that is the current situation in the refugee camps that have, spr- that have sprouted up all across the southern parts of the Gaza Strip. In the last week, substantial diseases have been reported as spreading through the Gaza Strip as a result of very poor sanitation conditions, as a result of lack of access to clean water, and also different sanitation crises, as well as hunger that is spreading through the different refugee camps. Moving on to the West Bank, and I will add the figures that I state in this next section about the West Bank include East Jerusalem as well. Since October 7th, there were substantial escalations of violence in the West Bank. These include settler attacks against Palestinians, Palestinian attacks against settlers, and the IDF, as well as IDF raids. The economic situation of Palestinians in the West Bank has also become much more dire. This is a result of the fact that after the October 7th attack, all work permits of Palestinians from the West Bank to work in Israel were cancelled. This is upwards of 100,000 Palestinians who have official work permits to work in Israel, and there are many more who work in Israel without work permits. However, all of the crossings were closed. In addition to that, Israel, as a result of deals historic deals between Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization and later the Palestinian Authority, Israel collects taxes for the Palestinian Authority and on a monthly basis transfers them to the Palestinian Authority. This was frozen after October 7th as a result of 
different political pressure because Palestinian Authority also pays salaries of officials in the Gaza Strip and Israel refused to transfer the money that would get to the Gaza Strip. Since then, that money has been frozen, which means the Palestinian Authority is on the brink, brink of bankruptcy as well. So there's dire economic straits also for the governing Palestinian Authority as well as for the Palestinians on the ground. Regarding some of the figures since the war broke out, a total of 339 Palestinians have been killed in the West Bank since October 7th. These include 330 by the IDF, most of these in different confrontations as the IDF carried out different raids in different towns. Eight of these by settlers, one unknown if it was by, an IDF, by the IDF or by a settler. 4,197 Palestinians are reported injured. A total of four Israelis were killed in the West Bank by different Palestinian attacks. 36 Israelis were killed throughout Israel by, by Palestinian attacks that originated from the West Bank. A total of 413 Israeli settler attacks against Palestinians were recorded since the war began. 41 of these resulted in bodily harm. 321 resulted in property damage. There's also a substantial increase in internally displaced Palestinians in the West Bank since the war began. Upwards of 1,210 Palestinians are reported internally displaced as a result of settler violence or official restrictions to their homes since the war began, and over 1,000 additional Palestinians are reported internally displaced as a result of other facets such as their homes being destroyed in different IDF raids. The IDF has reported that since the war began in its different operations, it has arrested over 2,650 Palestinians in the West Bank. Of these, 1,300 are reportedly Hamas operatives. The IDF is also reporting that it carried out over 40 major division operations in the different areas of the West Bank. The IDF is trying to stop an uprising in the West Bank that would join the Gaza Strip, and most of its operations so far have targeted areas like Jenin, Nablus, different refugee camps, as well as the different villages that are reported to have a lot of Hamas activity. Moving on to another front, the Lebanese front, the b northern border of Israel, southern border of Lebanon. Hamas called upon all actors, including in the West Bank and specifically Hezbollah, to join the war on October 7th. On October 8th, Hezbollah began firing rockets and missiles from southern Lebanon, and there was an expectation within Hamas and somewhat within Israel that Hezbollah was going to throw all of its weight into the war. Hezbollah has a very, very strong army. It has upwards of 130,000 missiles and a very well-trained division called the Radwan Force that is, has been training an invasion against Israel the same way as Hamas's Nuhba Force in, trained and also carried out their invasion on October 7th. And there was this preparation for Hezbollah to join the war. On November 3rd, despite monumental pressure, Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah made a speech in which he stated that Hezbollah has already joined the war and essentially substantiating that the group is not intending to throw more of its weight into the war beyond this what we call low-level escalations of rockets, missiles, mortars being sent now and then, small-scale cross-border incursions, but Hezbollah does not plan to launch an all-out war from Lebanon into Israel, at least thus far. Hassan Nasrallah has repeatedly called the war 100% Palestinian, stating that the role of Hezbollah is to support Hamas and the resistance from Gaza, and this was even upheld such that when there was a truce and hostage exchange between Israel and Hamas between November 24th and November 30th, that deal did not include Lebanon, not include Hezbollah. Nonetheless, when Hamas agreed to a truce, Hezbollah also honored the truce, and during that week, there was no fighting between Israel and Hezbollah. Regarding a total, some total figures, since the war began, a total of 2,000 rockets, mortars, and missiles were sent from Lebanon into Israel since the war began. These have caused a lot of damage in the different areas in the northern parts of Israel. 30 rockets and mortars were also sent from Syria. On January 5th, Hezbollah stated that it carried out over 670 border incidents against Israel since the war began. Border incidents usually refers to gunfire against an IDF outpost or attempted incursions or things like that. Regarding IDF retaliations, every day in response to the different mortars and missiles and rockets that are launched, the IDF carries out a substantial array of retaliations. It also occasionally carries out what it calls initiated attacks rather than retaliations. According to the IDF, they have targeted over 750 targets in southern Lebanon, mostly attacking Hezbollah infrastructure, warehouses, different weapons cache, and launching sites. Regarding casualties, 170 Hezbollah operatives were reported killed by the IDF. Hezbollah places that number as much less. There are also several Israelis that have been killed in the different rocket and missile attacks that occurred since the war began. In addition to this, in Lebanon, Israel has, in the last several weeks, carried out several high-profile assassinations 
Chief among these is Salah al who is the deputy leader of Hamas, who is based in Lebanon, specifically in the Dahia region, which is the main stronghold of Hezbollah. He was assassinated on January 2nd, 2024. Israel did not officially take responsibility for that assassination. However, it is pretty safe to say that it was carried out by Israel. In addition to that, Wissam Tawil, who is the leader of Hezbollah's Radwan force, that special commando force that I was referring earlier, was assassinated on January 8th. Israel also did not officially take responsibility for this assassination. However, one of Israel's ministers, seemingly accidentally, stated that Israel was responsible for this in an interview later that evening. Moving on from this to the regional developments that have occurred since the war began. Immediately as the war broke out, Iranian militias throughout the Middle East began to threaten the United States, stating that if the U.S. intervenes in the war, then U.S. interests throughout the Middle East are going to become a target. The United States, in turn, sent 2,000 Marines and different aircraft carriers to the region and started to threaten other forces, such as Hezbollah and different different militias in Syria, to not enter the war, to not open up another front against Israel. And thus, the region was pulled in as well, as different Iranian militias were threatening the United States, and the United States were threatening other different other militias and actors to not enter the war. Towards the end of October, U.S. bases started to be targeted by different Iranian-affiliated militias, specifically two of the most noted, noted ones are Hezbollah and Iraq brigades, that is a different outfit than Hezbollah and Lebanon, Hezbollah and Iraq brigades, and the Islamic resistance in Iraq. In addition to this, the Houthis, who, is another, who are also affiliates of Iran, who have taken over large areas of Yemen since 2014, also began escalating the rhetoric immediately as the war began, and they made their threats more explicit on October 22nd when they said that they are going to start firing at Israel and threatening ships that are destined to Israel or Israeli ships that pass through the Red Sea. On October 26th, they launched their first missiles towards Israel, and on November 19th, they hijacked their first ship with a, that had minimal connection to an Israel business person. However, the ship was hijacked and currently is still held in Yemen. Regarding some total figures since the war began, between October 17th and January 12th, over 130 attacks were carried out against U.S. bases in Iraq and Syria. 53 of these were in Iraq, 77 of these in Syria. Most of these were carried out by drones or missiles. They often cause several injuries. There have been no fatalities and no major damage caused. However, 130 attacks have occurred. In several instances, the United States also carried out retaliations against these different militias. Usually, these were carried out several days later. In addition, on the Yemeni front, upwards of 27 attacks against different maritime vessels were reported. Most of these, additionally, had some tangential connection to Israel. Sometimes they were owned partly by an Israeli, or the Houthis claimed that they were destined for Israel, or had some affiliation with Israel, even though most of the time they did not. Since then, a lot of different international commerce units stated that they were going to stop sailing through the Red Sea, and this started to become a larger threat on international commerce. On December 18th, the United States launched Operation Prosperity Guardian, in which it convened with a bunch of other countries to form a maritime coalition in order to start patrolling the Red Sea and to try to protect different vessels in the area. The coalition also launched its reta own retaliation against the Houthis on January 11th. For the first time, rather than just defending ships in the area, the coalition launched a massive attack led by the United States and the United Kingdom against different Houthi outfits. According to different reports, they launched over 130 missiles and targeted between 60 and 80 different Houthi sites in order to retaliate and also cripple the Houthis' ability to carry out these attacks. Since then, the Houthis have said they're going to continue to carry out the attacks. There's also reports that the coalition has continued attacking in Yemen. These reports have so far been denied. That is the current situation as far as the region goes. Regarding the future of Gaza, the political developments, what is going to happen 100 days in? We are actually not that more advanced than where we were on October 8th. Israel is vowed that it is going to destroy Hamas. According to the Israeli government, the political establishment, the war is not going to end until Hamas is destroyed. Sometimes that rhetoric has changed a little bit to saying Hamas's governing and military capabilities are dismantled, which is something that is a little bit more operational than the amorphic destroying Hamas. However, that is still, as far as Israel is concerned, the aim of the war. The United States is mounting heavy pressure on Israel to formulate a day-after plan to say, let's assume that that does happen and Hamas is in fact destroyed, what happens then? What happens in the Gaza Strip? Israel has officially stated that it does not plan on governing the Gaza Strip. However, it does plan on maintaining security operations there and security freedom for the IDF. The United States, the EU, different elements in the world have come to Israel saying, what does that mean? 
How does that look? Who is going to gov- govern the Gaza Strip? Right now, there does not seem to be an answer. The United States is pressuring Israel to try to incorporate the Palestinian Authority back into Gaza Strip in order to have some sort of vision towards a two-state solution. Israel, again, officially, is stating that the Palestinian Authority will never set foot in the Gaza Strip, that they are an outfit that also supports, supports terrorism, and that that is not part of the plan. Israel has come up with several different plans, and they, these have been leaked. Some of these included setting up some sort of interim government of local Palestinians from the Gaza Strip. Some of these include some sort of regional government that may include either Egypt, Saudi Arabia, or Gulf countries. All these countries have said that they will not take part in any such endeavor. In addition to this, there are many hawkish elements within Israel's government that are calling for far more radical plans. These are calling for what they call willful immigration, of Palestinians from the Gaza Strip, encouraging Palestinians to leave the Gaza Strip to a third country. And some of these are also calling for the reestablishment of Israeli settlements in the Gaza Strip that were evacuated in 2005. Again, these are just elements within Israel's government. It's not Israel's official policy. However, they are elements that sit in Israel's cabinet and could be part of the decision-making bodies later on. That is the current stalemate when it comes to the future of the Gaza Strip. There is no agreed-upon plan what is going to happen. Israel has been very adamant about what's not going to happen. It has stated that there is not going to be a Palestinian Authority and that Israel is not going to give up security control of the Gaza Strip. Israel officially has also said that there's not going to be a long-lasting occupation and not going to be a re-establishment of settlements, despite those voices within Israel's government that say that there will. Officially, Israel saying that that's not what's going to happen. The United States, during this time, is supporting Israel in the war quite unconditionally. However, there were reports that came out even today, January 14th, stating that the United States and the Biden administration is losing its patience with Israel with regards to not formulating a day after plan. Specifically, it was reported that in the Biden administration, there's growing suspicion that Prime Minister Netanyahu is going to prolong the war in order to serve his political interests and his political survival, and that that is one of the reasons that the aims of the war are being left very amorphous. That is my summary for the last 100 days of the Israel-Hamas war. I will be back to daily updates on every 24 hours tomorrow.